Stay connected to your community and save. Just 99 cents a month gets you three months of unlimited access to Inform.com. Visit Inform.com slash subscribe and get your first three months of news for only 99 cents a month. Stella Hildry was only a teenager when gangster Al Capone stopped by her family's cafe in Petersburg, North Dakota. He asked her to lock the doors and serve him dinner. It became a night she'd never forget. Hi, this is Tracy Briggs, and welcome to Back Then. This is part two of a three-part special report, The Capones in North Dakota. Part one, last time, examined how Al Capone's oldest brother, Vincenzo, became a law enforcement officer at Standing Rock. If you'd like to listen to that, just go back to Back Then last time, but you do not need to listen to these stories in order. Stella Hildry was being a good daughter that night. Her parents ran the cafe in Petersburg, North Dakota. To give her busy mom the night off, she volunteered to cook and wait tables that night. Her good friend Agnes Oslison, a couple of years older than Stella, agreed to help. Hildre once told Mysteries magazine, I remember it was a beautiful day and evening. Now, she certainly wasn't afraid to be in the cafe alone that night. It was her home away from home. Her parents had purchased the cafe in the middle of town in 1925, and she helped when she could. Pretty mundane stuff, really. Serve the customers, mostly nearby farmers, a hot roast beef sandwich, a cup of coffee, and a piece of pie, and they'd be on their way. But the young women had no idea what they were in store for that night, a night that would become one of the most memorable of their entire lives. A story Hildry would tell well into her 90s of the time she served supper to Al Scarface Capone. The story begins when an unusual car, black and fancy with tinted windows, drove ever so slowly down Petersburg's quiet downtown streets. The car pulled up outside the Hildry Cafe. Hildry told William Jackson from his book, More Dakota Mysteries and Oddities, that the men came in wearing fine clothes to have dinner. The occupants of the car then instructed Hildry and Oslison to tell anyone else who came to the cafe that it was closed, and they asked the teens to lock the door. Hildry said they weren't scared because oftentimes people having private parties at the cafe wanted to have the doors locked. But then the men drew the shades. Hildry said, that seemed really odd to me. To make it even odder, some of the men stood guard outside with Tommy guns, while others climbed the stairs between the cafe and the hardware store next door to perch themselves on the diner's roof, also with guns in hand. At the time, Petersburg had a population of just around 300 people, so the young waitresses were probably a little puzzled, wondering what was so concerning to them. Despite being a little uneasy, what could they do? The young women needed to make food for these men, who obviously weren't locals. But were they really big city mobsters? Was it really Al Capone? They weren't quite sure at this point, but they did have their suspicions. No matter who they were, they all ordered steak, and the young waitresses started cooking. Hildry said later, They were all very nice-looking and polite. They took up two tables, and one man even went to play a few popular tunes on the piano. Hildry said, We never heard it played that nice before. Best of all, Hildry recalled that Capone and his men liked their food. She said, They enjoyed our cooking. They couldn't get over how we two girls could cook those steaks. They were all very nice. This one especially, I'm sure it was him, Capone. He was very nice to us. They just seemed like a group of people who came in for a good time. The mobsters didn't stay long, and when they left, the man believed to be Capone left each of them a $5 tip. In today's money, that would equal about $87. So you can imagine, the girls were thrilled. With small-town gossip being what it is, word got around the next day that it was Capone's crew driving through Petersburg that night. Hildry said people asked them, aren't you scared? She said they weren't sure whether they should have been scared or thrilled. Karen O'Neill is married to Stella's son, Marty. She says when she first met her mother-in-law and she told the story about her brush with Al Capone, Karen also asked her if she wasn't just a little bit afraid that night. Karen said, I remember, Stella said, 
Well, I guess we didn't have time to think about it. We were too busy cooking their steaks. Now, even if they weren't scared, at least they had a heck of a story to tell. So whatever happened to Stella Hildry and Agnes Oslison? Well, Stella eventually married a widower named John Leland O'Neill. Together, they raised his two children from his late wife and six of their own. Agnes married George Goodry and had two children. Both women remained in the region until their deaths. Agnes died in 1991 and Stella in 2007, giving them decades to tell the amazing story of serving steak to Scarface. Joe O'Neill is married to Stella's son, Bob. She said, Stella talked about it a lot. At one time, she did a handwritten story of her life and included it. Many years ago, before she passed away, she even took us to Petersburg and showed us where the cafe was. It didn't surprise Bob O'Neill, her son, at all to hear that his then-teenage mother wasn't rattled by the presence of gangsters in her family cafe. Bob said, my mom was the oldest of six kids. She was so mature because she kind of had to take charge. It also doesn't surprise Stella's sons and daughters-in-law that we spoke with that Stella would say the gangsters were both nice and polite. Joe said, she would always think like that. She was just like that. Bob added, my mom taught us that if you didn't have anything nice to say, don't say anything. So sometimes if we get a little quiet, you'll know why. But was this really Al Capone that night? At this point, there is no definitive proof that it was him and his crew driving through Petersburg that night. But given the secrecy of the mob boss and his efforts to lay low when he traveled, evidence and certainly photos would be hard to come by. But over the years, he had been spotted by many people traveling along a route that included what is now North Dakota Highway 2 that goes right through Petersburg. His bootlegging interest in smuggling whiskey in from Canada would give him reason to be near the border. To have any hope of verifying that Capone and his men were actually in Petersburg, it might help to know exactly when this incident happened, but that's not exactly clear. Stella's son Marty O'Neill believes his mother was about 16. Other published stories simply say that Stella and Agnes were teens and high schoolers. So, given the girls' birth dates, it most likely happened between 1926 and 1929. It is interesting to note that, according to Capone's biography, he went into hiding for three months in 1926 after he and some of his gunmen inadvertently killed a prosecutor in Chicago. So... Was North Dakota considered remote enough to be his hideout spot for those three months? Or was he here for another reason? As mentioned in part one of the Capones in North Dakota, Al Capone's older brother Vincenzo was working as a federal agent in North Dakota at this very same time. Is there an off chance he was stopping by to say hi to his big brother or even talk business? Eh, that's probably not likely, as the brothers from opposing sides of the booze battle had informally agreed to stay out of each other's territories. Also, while Vincenzo was technically working in North Dakota, he was stationed at the Standing Rock Indian Reservation, which is more than four hours south of Petersburg. And finally, Capone was known to head north from Chicago to vacation in nearby Minnesota and Wisconsin, so a trip to eastern North Dakota is certainly within the realm of possibility. In fact, rumors have swirled in the Grand Forks area for years about close relationships between Capone and some bar owners in East Grand Forks. It was also rumored that he visited or even had homes on lakes in western Minnesota, including Lake Melissa, Bass Lake, Little Bemidji, and Fishhook Lake. That's just to name a few. We will tackle Al Capone at the lake and more in part three of the Capones in North Dakota. Thanks for joining me on Back Then. I hope you check us out next time. Get reliable and accurate local news with Inform.com. Inform.com is your trusted local news source with journalists dedicated to keeping you informed about what's happening in your community. Visit inform.com now.